Scripture today is from John 14, 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do, not, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do and, in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask him, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. It is a personal privilege to welcome Reverend Greg Kroger back to this pulpit, which he so honorably and capably served while pastor in this church from 2002 to 2006, and then helped to oversee while he was our United Methodist District Superintendent from 2006 to 2010. Greg, a native of Canton, South Dakota, earned his bachelor's degree from Oral Roberts University and his Master of Divinity degree from Sioux Falls Seminary. Uh, Wall Drug uh, may be best known for its free ice water and its fine uh, jackalope collection, but it played a far uh, more important role in the evolution of the Kroger family. Joyce Ann and Greg Kroger uh, met there while they were uh, summer employees at Wall Drug. They were 19 and 18 years old, respectively. And I must say, it turned out quite well. Uh, they've been married since uh, 1980. The Krogers have two adult sons, Carl and Caleb, a daughter-in-law, Michelle, and a three-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, Maisie. The entire Kroger family made a significant positive contribution to the spiritual health and vitality of Sioux Falls First United Methodist Church at a time when we needed it. We were blessed to have Greg, Joyce Ann, Carl, and Caleb as part of this Christian community, benefiting from Greg's outstanding pastoral leadership and Joyce Ann's lay role as coordinator of congregational care. Greg has dedicated his career to the ministry and will mark his 30th year as a United Methodist pastor in 2017. Greg is on loan to us today from his current appointment as, as lead pastor of Rapid City First United Methodist Church. Please welcome home Reverend Greg Kroger. Thank you very much, Jack. And it is indeed a holy privilege to be with all of you this morning. Uh, Joyce Ann and I have not only many fond memories, but you all are persons that we carry in our thoughts, in our hearts, in our prayers to this day, and that will always be the case. Uh, this is a place, one of those, a number of places that we can call a spiritual home. And uh, what a blessing to be joined with you here this morning. I just need to make one addition, Jack, to, to your introduction that I don't think I can live up to, but I'll, I'll try. And that is that Maisie has a little brother now, Mitchell, who is a year and a half. In fact, why don't we just uh, bring that, you know, I had to bring a shameless grandparent picture 
uh, today. So there's, there's Maisie and there is Mitchell. Mitchell's a year and a half. I was thinking about them um, in the course of preparing, reflecting on the scripture text for today and for this message. Because as I think about Maisie and Mitchell and as much as they love Nana and Papa, when uh, they come to our house for us to watch them and Mommy and Daddy walk out that door, you don't see those smiles. <laughs> there is, especially from Maisie, there is crying and there is wailing. And she misses Mommy and Daddy. Separation is hard. She usually gets over it in a few moments, but then when they come back to pick them up and head on home to Piedmont, she is thrilled. She is thrilled that uh, they're back together. Maisie, like many of us, can find that when we are separated from those that we love, from those who are dear to us, our hearts can be troubled. These are the words of Jesus that we find in our passage today. Jesus speaks about our hearts being troubled. And certainly that was the situation for the disciples. As they gathered together in the upper room, and looking back, if we would do so to John 13, 33, Jesus begins to speak of the fact that he's going to be leaving them. He's going away. And Peter speaks up and says, well, where are you going? And Jesus says, you can't go with me. Peter protests, I'll go with you. I'll go with you to the point of death. I can imagine Jesus giving Peter a look of, yeah, right. About the only thing that you're going to do tonight is deny me three times. And Peter, as he denies Jesus, becomes the very living illustration of giving in to a troubled heart. And so Jesus encourages the disciples to not let their hearts be troubled. He urges them to stand firm in the face of his departure, for the events that are about to happen will make it seem as if evil and death are having their way. And so Jesus says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. It is a rallying cry for them to gain strength in him, to stand steadfast in the face of of traumatic events. Well, what would free the human heart from being troubled? The world has a multitude of answers. Jesus has only one. Believe in God. Believe in me. Jesus speaks of believing almost exclusively, not as something to which one assents inwardly, but as an outward and active commitment to a person. The person being himself. Commentator Cynthia Jarvis notes that the words of Martin Luther come to mind as she thinks about this passage. Because it was in response to Luther's commentary on the first and greatest commandment, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that Luther says God is what you hang your heart on. The heart that is troubled is a heart not hung upon God, but hung rather on all the things that the world peddles to soothe a troubled heart. Jesus tells his disciples in their time of need, hang your hearts on God. Hang your hearts on me. You know, in a few weeks there will be a, a little motorcycle rally out in the Black Hills. Maybe some of you are planning to go. I hope you have your reservations if you are. Now, every year when the rally rolls around, I know, I just know, because I've heard about it, and it's so easy to imagine. I know there are families who come rolling into Rapid City or into one of the nearby towns in the Black Hills and they have no idea that the rally is underway. 
They've made no reservations. They're just going with the flow. Well, let's stay here. And after a long day of travel, they're, nothing, they're wanting nothing more than a, a clean, cool motel room. Maybe with a pool outside so that the children who've been cooped up in the minivan all day can expend their stored up energy. And then they hear the word, sorry, there's no rooms available here. Sorry, there's no rooms available there. And maybe if there is a room, the answer will be, yeah, there's a room, but I don't think you want to know the price. My heart goes out to them because they have no place to be. They're stuck. How frustrating. How troubling. That question goes beyond just situational difficulties. In fact, it goes to the very foundation of life. One of the very basic questions of life, of our existence, is where will we be? And for some, having a home is a daily crisis. We may wonder where we'll be in the future. Where will we retire? And we all face the eventuality of mortal death. Just where is heaven? And what is it going to be like? So Jesus offers these words that evoke the image of a magnificent villa or a cluster of dwellings. Jesus promises that he will and indeed has prepared a place where his followers will be with him in the world beyond death. So that despite the separation that death will cause, The bond of love and fidelity between Jesus and those who believe in him cannot be broken. Friends, we will always have a place to be in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in God. Let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus reassures them that they know the way to where he is going. But Thomas, like Peter, seems just as confused about where Jesus is going. And the way is not a step-by-step set of directions. It's not a, a literal road as Thomas perceives. To know the way means knowing Jesus himself. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, the way is a, a representation of life with God. Life with God is the way. And Jesus shows himself to be simultaneously the access to God and the embodiment of life with God. And stating that he is also truth and life, these terms clarify how Jesus indeed is the way for us. But Jesus explains that, that no one comes to the Father except through me. And when he says that, it is a, it's a joyous celebration that God has become accessible available knowable for jesus is the very presence of god in flesh and blood and when the disciples and the early church heard these words it was a message of extraordinary encouragement not a weapon to be used against non-christian neighbors unfortunately some followers of jesus today seize upon these words as a means to tear apart people. Love and respect toward those who hold other belief systems become diminished. In fact, sometimes attitudes and actions project obnoxious hostility. This really complicates the integrity of our witness and injects tension into our pluralistic, multicultural society. Now make no mistake, The life journey of a follower of Jesus Christ is to know more and more and more what it means to follow Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. And in so doing, experience the presence of the Father. We light our light from the one who is the light of the world, and we find ways to let it shine. And when the Holy Spirit works in the lives of others, no matter what their faith is, or whether they have faith at all, We have opportunity in those times to credibly share what God in Jesus Christ means to us, what God in Jesus Christ is doing in our lives. We don't have to tear down people to do God's work. I encourage us to 
to be ready and available to support the Holy Spirit's work of bringing people into relationship with God through Jesus and doing our part when called upon. Well, meanwhile, as as Jesus is talking, Philip is forming his burning question. Philip asks, Lord, would you just show us the Father? Would you just do that and we'll be satisfied? Philip was among the first to be drawn to Jesus, but he fails to grasp that as he sees Jesus, he has seen God. Jesus' words to Philip boldly express this perspective. Whoever has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. Jesus is is the lens through which we see and understand God. And, And when we peer through with lenses of our own creation, we may instead see something else. Think of these other popular notions of who God is. The old man in the sky, God. Or the angry judge, God. The absent God, my good buddy God, the tiny baby Jesus God, or any other God of human misperception. For sure, that's when it's time to focus our eyes through the proper lens, and that lens is Jesus. Those who believe in him are then promised that they will do greater works because Jesus is going to be with God in a place of advocacy and intercession on our behalf. And secondly, the works that will happen will bring glory to God through the Son. Works that glorify God issue from prayer that is in accordance with Jesus' own mission. I know that you are experiencing the reality of greater things happening in this congregation. You wrapped great big arms of love around Sioux Falls through the May Day outreach. The picture of 350 ministry volunteers gathered in vibrant red shirts and deployed to over 25 different places across this city is a picture that brings joy in heaven and blessing to many right here, right now. I know that in the next few weeks you're going to be making the lyrics of Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love, your very action. As you provide shoes to children through the Samaritan's Feet ministry. Great things are happening. Greater things are on the way. And while humility is always advised, we need to take Jesus at his word that he intends. We should do greater things. Perhaps even greater than those witnessed by the first disciples as they journeyed with him through ancient Palestine. We do so as we pray, as we align and pray and trust and ask. The disciples, and we by extension, are instructed to ask in his name. And Jesus assures that what is asked will be granted. Now praying in Jesus' name is not a magic formula. Just invoking the name of Jesus to whatever we want, name our desire, Close what in Jesus' name is not a way of saying, okay, I said the magic word, it'll happen. No, to pray in the name of Jesus is to align one's spiritual longing with that of the Lord. What happens when things aren't aligned? All of that energy, all the potential is dissipated because everything and everyone's headed off in all sorts of different directions. Imagine the effect the uh, offensive front line on a football team moving individually, independently, in whatever direction they feel like going. Snap the ball and everybody goes, doo, 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 doo. I mean, that would be crazy. <laughs> it would be absolutely chaotic. That's more than a busted play. It would make no sense at all. No sense at all when the goal is to win the game by advancing the ball and scoring points. A church that doesn't align with Jesus won't even make the crazy highlights video, and it certainly won't reach the goal. On the other hand, one in which people believe in Jesus, believe in God, with the same depth 
of trust and hope and work by God's grace to stay in alignment with Jesus. Wow. Wow. That is a church that can change the community. Change the world. So would you believe it? Would you believe it? Do I hear an amen out there this morning? Would you believe it? All right. Are you ready? Are you living it? Take heart. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus. You know, he's prepared a place for us when our work here is done. But in the meantime, we've got a lot of work to do. But he's shown us the way because he is our way. He's the truth. He's our life. He's drawing us closer and closer to God. And the more we see Jesus, the more we see God. And the closer that we're aligned with Jesus, the more that we're going to see what Jesus wants and what God wants for his kingdom. And we, you, we'll all begin to see things happen that we never thought possible in your life and in this congregation. So what do you say? Yes? No? Maybe? Friends, God's desire and my hope is that for all of us, the answer to this question, the answer to this question is a resounding yes. Would you believe it? Yes. Amen and amen.